Um, I'm Vivek Morthy. I'm, I'm a PhD student at the University of Notre Dame. And my title, my favorite, is Gender Bias, Structural Transformation, and Fertility. So fertility decline is a universal feature of the development process of all currently industrialized economies, and it played a key role in the sustained long-term per capita income growth of these economies. And historically, and in, modern and in modern cases, it occurred contemporaneously with structural transformation. A large literature has assigned a causal role of industrialization to fertility decline, where the rise of the manufacturing sector provided economic incentives to lower fertility. And you can think of this happening through many different channels. So for example, the rise of light industry and textile, manuf so textile manufacturing and light garment manufacturing um, provided lucrative opportunities to women, which raised the opportunity cost of having children and subsequently lowered fertility. However, many modern triggers of structural transformation are actually labor-saving agricultural push shocks rather than pulls from a growing manufacturing sector. And tasks in agriculture are often divided along gendered lines. So that means that these labor-saving shocks may vary disproportionately along with, gen with gender. And if the primary labor saved is female labor, and there's no subsequent like expansion of light industry or other industries that would employ women, this can have very different impact, um, implications for fertility. So the, what I'm gonna do in my paper is I look at the relationship between structural transformation triggered by these labor saving agricultural technology shocks and fertility. And I'm gonna exploit quasi experimental variation in the adoption of genetically engineered soy crop technology in Brazil. So women's work in agriculture across low and middle income countries tends to include tillage, of, tillage fertilizing and weeding operations. And then work looking at gender and agriculture in Brazil confirms that this is also the case in Brazil. Um, so Brazil legalized genetically engineered soy in 2003. And what this did was it obviated the need for tillage and weeding operations. So instead of having laborer and having laborers go and, um, and weed the land and clear the land to, put, to get rid of competing crops, the farmer could just spray herbicides effectively killing off all these, all these competing crops without, um, affecting the, without hurting the soy crop. So thinking about women's roles in agriculture, I hypothesize and I'm gonna show that this, um, had a, this led to a relative decline in the demand for female labor. So I'm establishing that there's a gendered nature to these technologies. And then contrary to some of the historic, some of the historic experiences of currently developed economies, I'm gonna show this actually increased fertility to, to, to incentives to traditional economic models. So I'm just looking at my specification. So I'm gonna be running a difference in difference specification where I'm gonna take a dependent variable in municipality M in time T and regress it on municipality fixed effect and on state time fixed effects to absorb any state year specific shocks and ensure that all comparisons are between municipalities within, um, within states. And this is important as different states may pass different policies which could affect fertility, um, as well as any cultural or differential migration changes that may be happening at a more aggregate level than within state. And then regress it on a measure of soy technical chains and then on control for some uh, expansion of simultaneous crops such as maize and maize technological change. And then allow for differential trends for different baseline characteristics such as the percentage of the municipality that's rural or the percentage of children living in low-income households and illiteracy rates, et cetera. And then for my labor market outcomes, I'm going to be looking at decennial census data. So for these two years, I'm going to be reporting um, results using first differences. To, I'm going to take first differences to purge the municipality fixed effect. And then importantly, following Bustos et al, who exploit this expansion of genetically engineered crops, instead of using actual yields in soy, which would likely be endogenous, I'm going to construct a measure of the potential increase in potential yields from adopting the technology from the UN FAUGA database. So it's importantly, this is a function of um, not rather than actual yields, it's a function of pre-existing soil and weather characteristics, which predict higher, which predict the um, increase of potential yields from adopting these technologies. And that's what I'm going to use for my measure of soy technical change. So for the first set of results, I'm going to be using the decennial census to look at, um, to show some labor market outcomes. So I'm going to be looking at um, income. So this figure is showing agriculture earnings, and each coefficient is a coefficient from a different set of regression. So the, um, so the first one is going to be um, female income, and what you can see is that there is a gendered nature of these technologies. So an increase in soy technical change leads to a decrease in female income. So specifically, um, an increase in one per hectare of potential soy yields leads to a decrease in female income in agriculture of about um, 10%. Um, so this is also consistent with what I hypothesized given women's roles in agriculture. And then also looking at men in male income, as you can see, it leads to an increase in men's income of about 4%, and then a subsequently a decrease in women's income relative to men's income of about 10%. Um, so, and importantly, I find no discernible impacts on changes in um, female wages or employment or reallocation of employment into other major sectors of the economy, including light industry, which, um, including light industry, which primarily hires, which primarily hires women. And then thinking of tr traditional models of economic fertility, what does this imply for fertility? Um, if, you, if you think, if you assume that the children are normal goods and that women bear most of the burden of childcare, then the reduction in female earnings would lower the opportunity cost of having children and um, cause a positive substitution effect towards fertility. The increase in men's income would serve primarily as an income effect, um, increasing the demand for children. 
And if we think about intra-household bargaining, the relative wage or the relative earnings may uh, be more indicative of the division of labor within households. So this reduction of relative wages, of this relative earnings of men, of women relative to men would also put an increase, would also increase risk. So then um, to look at the fertility results, I'm gonna use annual data. So I'm gonna be taking annual data from live birth certificates from the Brazilian uh, Ministry of Health. And then uh, I'm gonna be running this in an event style specification to trace out any differential pretrains of fertility, which would validate the use of low potential yields municipalities as a control. Um, and then also trace out any dynamic effects in the post period. Um, so fertility is defined as a number of live births per 1,000 women of fertile age, which the Ministry of Health defines as the ages of 10 to 49. And then I'm going to replace the time with, I'm going to, with a vector of um, year indicators for every year. And I'm going to omit the year 2002, which is the year prior to the legalization of these genetically engineered crops. Um, and then for, the, for just the interpretation, I'm going to replace these continuous measures of potential yield with um, an indicator variable, which is equal to one if the increase of potential yields is above the median increase of potential yield. So what this is measuring is comparing the above median potential yield municipalities to below in a given year relative to the base year, which is the year prior to the legalization of genetically engineered crops. So looking at these results, what you see is that um, there's an absence of uh, there's an absence of pretrends in the pre-period, which would help um, lend support to the identifying assumptions. And then following the legalization of genetically engineered crops, you start seeing a sustained increase in fertility in these higher in these in these kind of treatment regions. Um, and this is a, this is interesting because this runs contrary to the historical experiences uh, of other of current developed economies. And then looking at the year 2012, for example, you see that municipalities with the above median increase in potential soy yields saw an increase in live births of about uh, of fertility of about two births per 1,000 women relative to the control. And these effect sizes are economically meaningful as well. And this is comparable to studies on looking at fertility from gender bias technological change in the United States context. So for example, these size effects are similar in magnitude to um, work by Kearney and Wilson looking at the fracking boom, which was a shock uh, that um, primarily increased the income and job market opportunities of men. Um, so, so in conclusion, I established the gendered nature of these new agricultural technologies, and I contribute to a growing literature taken seriously in considering the gendered nature of technological change. And then there's a large interest in whether modern developing economies will follow the um, same experiences of current developed economies. And this shows an example that runs contrary to historical experiences. And importantly, um, these technologies will continue to be adopted across many low and middle income countries, many of which have stalled fertility transitions and much larger aggregate and much larger agricultural shares, which can imply like much larger effects at the aggregate level. So this would have this would have potential implications for growth going forward, and also for thinking about the continued of, of women's economic empowerment throughout the developing process. And those are my main results. And if you uh, welcome any um, comments, suggestions, questions, and if you, anyone posted comments, I can't see the comments. And um... um, I have a, a question uh, yeah. because first there's, there's quite a few of the boosters that are. So there's a, a recent booster that are that's about uh, migration and that's about, I guess, you know, uh, uh, labor switching sectors. Since you, you mentioned that it might be gender bias, I, I'm just wondering whether you've got that data as well and whether you can test like simple selection effects. And then that's just thinking about it as a robustness check, but then as a mechanism, it's fascinating as well. So maybe having a, a gender version of the of the of the migration results of the, the other Busto Seda or the third one. So I try, yeah, so thank you for that comment. And I'm trying this is this is an area I need to explore more for mechanisms, but I, I have tried I have looked at um example like the employment shares. So this is just total of paid employment, remunerated and remunerated employment in different sectors. And then as, as I keep as I keep dividing these, especially when I'm using state time fixed effects, as I keep dividing, I start losing power in estimating these effects, which is a challenge. Um, however, I can see, like for example, I think this is consistent with evidence that it's mainly men who are able to reallocate into different sectors as women's um, shares in these sectors tend to decline. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, my point was that that you don't have the women who change sectors, that you have a selection <laughs> because they, they moved out. Oh, they, you mean moved to dislocation? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I have, I have results looking at uh, migrations. So um, I find, for example, th there is a migration response when you include comparisons across states. However, when I'm including the state time fixed effects, I find no discernible impact on differential migration by gender um, across when I'm doing these comparisons within municipalities. Um, so th but that is, yeah, there is, there is work. That is, a, that is a channel I've been looking at because there is work showing that, for example, when textile mills expand in the US, there was like a migration which caused a lot of the response. Um, but yeah, but that is something I need to further explore for mechanisms. Yeah. Do you also look at some uh, other statistics, such as like time used during this period in Brazil, 
or the overall female labor force participation? You know, do you try to think about those things as well? Um, I have looked at other. I have looked at others. Um, I've tried looking at other things to bring this mechanism. So, un unfortunately, for time use, at least, I believe the pilot study for time use started in two thousand nine in Brazil. So it's it's after this period. Um, I have tried looking at. Um, I have tried looking at um, example like the, ch the share of women doing unpaid work, working either in farms for sustenance or for um, or or you unpaid work for another family member. And it's hard, it's hard to discern, it's hard for me to, I'm, I'm often underpowered in order to try to get these effects, but there's, but there is a sense of like, we're trying to explore other data sets to try to like, look more into that to get more detailed mechanisms on these, um, yeah, on that type, on these mechanisms, like a time use survey, or like, even the DHS survey, they only do it in 1996, and they don't have one in the post period. So I'm, uh, so in those, I'm kind of limited, um, I'm limited with the data sources I'm using now in trying to discern some of those, some more of those effects. So Vivek, I have a question. I don't want to crowd out anyone else though, because I can also talk to you offline. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone wants to interrupt me, go ahead. Um, I guess my question slash comment was something that related to what you said um, about uh, the other, the sort of the absence of other types of sectors that women could work in. So it kind of connects a little bit with Farzana's presentation earlier mm -hmm. today as well, where she was saying in India, one of the things that they think is going on is that there's no, um, you know, the manufacturing jobs are just not there for women to be doing. Um, and so that's sort of women are making these choices when you have this agricultural productivity shock um, and they're deciding sort of what to do with their time. And in India, at least, they're ending up at home. And so yeah. I'm wondering if whether you can say something about this in the Brazilian context by, and I, and I don't know the, um, uh, the structure of the economy spatially uh, very well, but is there some sort of variation uh, from before the shock happened where women, where those sectors were actually um, initially more present in space? And so you could mm. look at splitting out and seeing, does the fertility effect actually look different, heterogeneous, mm. um, in places where there were actually these other options for women to be doing some things, um, mm. And they didn't do them until you had these big productivity shocks um, versus other places where there just weren't those um, those opportunities available. Yeah, I, so I just thought about exploring that. Yeah, I, I, I thought about trying to explore that. So, for example, there is, um, for example, the service sector or even light manufacturing which highly employ women in these mm -hmm. areas. And then um, I think there's there's quite a bit of spatial variation that I think can be exploited. Um, for example, even thinking about farm size distribution, which I think like. So there's a couple of things like that which I can try to explore to try to like to help talk with these mechanisms. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments, suggestions? I could have gone longer than the <laughs> You could have taken a few more breaths in between, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about the um, the relative change in male female incomes? Yeah, so that's that's an area where I'm trying to explore. Um, that's an area where I'm trying to explore. Also, try I'm trying to exploit. I'm trying to one area of future research would try to be to. Um, isolate a bargaining channel for this relative income relative to um, just the straight opportunity cost traditional models mm -hmm. of economic. So maybe they could also be from the pre-existing DHS, DHS survey, for example, I can look at preferences for fertility and maybe somehow exploit that to look at differential effects by um, just isolating this relative income channel. Um, but at least in the, from the census data alone, it's relatively hard to get at that um, to more to further distinguish um, that channel. And there's also work like I'm trying to look at data potentially of um, there's also work potentially on like uh, looking at other data sources where just like the, the outgoing wage rate may be more indicative of the outside option within a marriage rather than the actual earnings um, and then splitting it up by like married households, et cetera. So there's definitely work there that could be done to try to further distinguish these different channels. 